The campaign season is upon us, as we all know, and safety security is top on the priority list as there, are, uh, there has been a war of wards between the APC and the PDP, as both of them have said one or the other is behind the banditry in the Northwest and the country in general. While our focus is on what government and politicians should be doing to quell this situation going forward. Joining us to discuss this is security expert Kaber Adamu. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Adamu. Thank you, Miriam. Good Great. evening. Great. Um, there are so many things that, you know, when you talk about the issue of insecurity, it's a potpourri of issues, whether it's kidnapping, it's Boko Haram, on the other hand, it's banditry. Um, I mean, we, we're seeing it all over the place. A, a few um, days ago, it was the case in Imo State where a monarch was kidnapped, killed, and then dumped in um, the village square. We've also seen one that was kidnapped and, and he was released. We've seen something similar happen in Zamfara State, but good news is, We've also seen that the, um, the Air Force has neutralized two very notorious, um, you know, um, gunmen, in fact, terrorists, let's call them that, uh, in the same Zamfara state. So there are pluses and there are minuses. But let's start with the challenges of fighting this insecurity, this, especially the ones that we've been facing lately in Nigeria. Yeah, thank you uh, once again, um, Marianne, and Happy New Year to, to you. Uh, the challenges are, frankly, the nature of the um, security issues we're dealing with. Um, they are asymmetric, they are urban, and they are enemies that live with us that are sometimes, um, you know, one and the same with the, the society. So a little bit difficult for, um, you know, conventional approach where you know the enemy is um, aside, he or she has declared himself and is attacking you. Um, in this instance, these are you know, part of the, cit um, the citizenry. In certain instances, an industry has even emerged that has different levels of participation, what we call a value chain. Um, so specifically, when, you, when, I'm talk, when we use um, kidnapping as an example, you would identify that there are several um, levels of pa participants within that industry called kidnapping. Um, and most of these participants are individuals that are living together with us. Uh, and um, so that makes it a little bit difficult. But um, that is not to excuse the failure of um, especially the criminal justice system to arrest and punish offenders. So that's I would say, challenge number two. Uh, the various, um, you know, structural deficiencies within our criminal justice system that has prevented the arrest and the punishment of offenders. Uh, our criminal justice system is, in, a, in summary, divided into three. The law enforcement component, which includes um, agencies like the police that are supposed to arrest and gather evidence and then present that to the second um, level, which is the judicial system. Now, the judicial system is supposed to look at the evidences that have been presented by the law enforcement and then prosecute the, the suspect, as it were. And then the last one are the correctional services. Now, if you look at all these three aspects, you very well know that they, are, they all have their issues. Um, there is none of them that I will pick that I can't spend the next 24 hours discussing the various challenges they have. So you can understand how um, the deterrence element within our criminal justice system is no longer existent. The third one, and which is for me the most important challenge, is our value system that has more or less dropped to a level that is scary. Um, the average young person, and in fact most adults too, have failed or lost the capacity to differentiate between good and bad. They commit offenses without bothering to, you know, even ask if this, what, what they are doing is good or bad. Uh, people drive against traffic. People, you know, bring in things that are illegal. They attempt to sell them. People, you know, deal in guns. They deal in drugs, all in the name of hustling and looking for money without even considering that those things are illegal. All they talk about is risk without asking whether that is. And so the next thing is to ask, why did our value system fail like that? And I've attempted to look at the four major shapers of value within the society, starting from the family unit, 
that frankly has, is not performing that responsibility of um, effectively um, you know, um, um, impacting good values to a lot of children. And so these children come up and end up being terrorists, end up being bandits, because they are not ghosts. They are children that come from within us. The second aspect is the school system. Um, I recently traveled to, you know, uh, uh, let me not mention the state, but um, the guy who picked me from the airport, who is an Uber driver, is um, a teacher. And I had him making a phone call. He was supposed to be supervising uh, an exam. And by God, he had collected money from the parents of um, the pupils, and he was allowing them. So the person who he had asked to stay in his place was helping him to allow them to actually cheat during that exam. And when I confronted him on that, he felt it was okay. And except if we decide to kid ourselves, this is something that is commonplace. How many parents actually bribe or pay, um, you know, the school administration or even the those who are vigilating to allow their kids to, you know, steal? And those, so, what do you expect that child to grow up to be? Now, the third element is our religious institutions that are also contribute to shaping the value system. And we all know, you know, there are so many issues affect, affecting them. In fact, if they were playing their role, even where the first two, the family and the schools fail, then the religious bodies would be at least able to correct certain aspects. And then the last one, and I hate to say this, I hope you don't drive me away, is the media. The media too has a, a, a critical element in correcting values because uh, based on what, what you put out there. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, today, whether fortunately or unfortunately, we're in an era where the media has become so amorphous. You have the mainstream media, you have social media. And so that contribution to shaping uh, our values has also been affected by, by this, this aspect. So in a nutshell, these are the challenges. And that is why it has become extremely difficult for com to use conventional means to address the security challenges that we have at the moment. Mm. Let's talk about the politicization of the whole issue, because uh, when I started, I, I did say that it, it's been a war of wars between the sitting, um, ruling all progressive Congress and, of course, the opposition, the PDP. It's been, oh, you're behind it. No, you're behind it. You seem to be feeling it. No, you're not the one. You know, so it, it looks more like this issue could have been easily dealt with. Uh, without the politicization of the issue. Again, let's talk about the fact that when it comes, when it's close to election season, we start hearing these politicians wax lyrical and come up with ideas that they think are very novel to deal with this insecurity as opposed to making it happen. Uh, I want to know, as a security person, what should be um, forming the conversations as we get ready or we gear up to pick someone, whoever, whether it be at state levels, at uh, senatorial levels, or even at the presidency level, what should be the things that be part of the conversations that they're having that would make us want to vote these people into office in, as opposed to this war of wards that we're seeing today? Um, brilliant question, Miriam. And I, at the risk of, um, you know, uh, putting out there uh, something that would scare uh, a few persons, it, where, where we, this is just the beginning. It's going to get worse. Um, in the era of social media and artificial intelligence, um, we've seen instances across the world. And in fact, we've been told that even in Nigeria, they did it in the 2019 elections. So it's going to be, get worse in the 2023 elections. They are going to bring in AI, at, at artificial intelligence, that will create bots and several other... Um, you know, artificial intelligence platforms on social media to for prop prop propaganda. And this is going to be on both sides. The government is going to do that where, in an attempt to show success. And then the opposition is also going to do that. So um, Facebook, um, Twitter, and uh, name them, all the social media platforms, unfortunately, are going to have a barrage of this, um, you know, capabilities. Uh, and today, in today's world, there are several institutions, several agencies that are selling these capabilities. So any politician who, you know, has done a little bit of research, like I said, they did it in 2019. So I am almost certain that they're going to do it in 2023 um, as well. Um, now, what capabilities do we have as a country to monitor that and to counter it? Now, I'm sure the smart listener would say, well, the government is also going to do the same thing, so it's going to be a balance of capabilities as, as it were. Uh, but that's not what sh should bother us. What should bother us as Nigerians is what do we want? And that is why I love your question. Um, what we want is someone who will come up and show to us in clear terms 
that this is the strategy he or she wants to pursue to address the security challenges in the country and show in clear terms the key performance indicators, the, the monitoring and evaluation systems that will be in place in that strategy that would allow us, that will allow the media to now say, okay, this is what you've promised. This is how are we going to measure you. Now, he, he or she will provide the key performance indicators that would allow every Nigerian to say, okay, within six months of his, his appointment, this and this he has been able to do. And one of the best indicators of that is um, in 2021, about 10,000 Nigerians were killed um, you know, due to all of the security challenges. Now, anyone who in real terms want to reduce or contain the security challenges in the country should bring down to that to at least below 5,000. Then we can now clap for him and say, okay, 10,000 were killed in 2021. In 2022, 5,000. And then in 2023, less than 1,000. And then eventually, but where we don't have those type of um, key performance indicators, those type of measurement metrics in, in, in within our security architecture, then it makes it almost impossible. So what we do is we ask critical questions. We demand for these types of strategies that will show in clear terms what um, the individuals intend to do. And I can for free you know, offer this to our uh, would-be politicians. We have the drivers of insecurity. Um, poverty, unemployment, um, you know, our, the weak criminal justice system that I mentioned, uh, weapons proliferation, the climate change issues, uh, porous borders, um, name them. So anyone who wants to address security challenges must show in clear terms how he or she intends to address all of these drivers. And more importantly, the security sector governance, um, the soft side that I've mentioned, must be complemented by this other hard side, which is the kinetic uh, issues that you hear politicians mention. But the security sector governance that would allow us to have a democratic security arrangement where the ethos of their functions is geared at protecting us, you and I and the every Nigerian, and more importantly, respecting our human rights as well as um, implementing a system where even the, uh, the last person that is in my village is able to have a sense of belonging in terms of protection for security. So any politician who does not do that, believe me, is going to repeat what has been done in the last probably 40, 50 years that has led us to where we are at the moment. And so the onus is on us to, as we say in Nigeria, shine our eyes and make sure we ask these critical questions in terms of strategies, in terms of policies, in terms of key performance indicators, in terms of metrics that would allow us to measure performances within the security sector. You, you mentioned some things that uh, I have been brooding over, um, you know, porous, the porousness of our borders, most importantly. Um, because over the years, I'm, and I'm talking about from 2014 down to 2021, we've seen guns continuously come into the country. And we know it, they, they start coming into, uh, into the country at about this time. We've even seen some, a few of them in 2021, guns come continuously coming into the country. Where are these guns going to? We never see a follow-up on these stories, where they're emanating from, who or what companies you know, were responsible for shipping them. We never, we just hear about it. Um, the press covers it when you know, it's uncovered. And then that's it. We hear nothing else about it. Again, the process of our borders, I've heard it since I was a teenager. Oh, our borders are porous, but nothing has been done. I'm asking this question especially because the president of this country, as we speak, is the, per the only person that campaigned that he was going to make sure that insecurity becomes a thing of the past when he comes into office. It's almost a year left in his tenor for him to say goodbye. And can we really say that Mr. President has done anything to deal with this or even scratch the surface? Secondly, the president was just on channels television this evening and he was asked a question about the issue of grazing routes. And he stands unchallenged on that issue. He seems not to be shifting ground. Does the body language of the president look like that of a person who wants us to go back to a place of some form of sanity if some of these issues he still seems to be headstrong about them? Um, so, yes, um, overall, I would say the president has demonstrated the willingness and desire to address um, security 
challenges in the country. We know, for instance, that um, the 42 times that he has run and that he has been elected, uh, security is part of the three-part agenda that he has put forward to Nigeria and report upon which Nigerians voted in. We also know that um, he has attempted to look at the challenges within the security um, architecture and in an attempt to address them. So one of the challenges is our moribund policies. Uh, one, of what, one of the first things he tried to do is to review those policies. And then we've also seen a, an attempt by him to procure we, weapons. Uh, all of these are issues that, uh, you know, if you're going to score him, you'd score him highly. But the, the challenge is this. How has of all of these things that he has attempted to do translated into a reduction in fatalities? And that is where the, 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 the difficulty is. Frankly, not, not, not so much. Um, despite all of these huge investments, we haven't seen a major reduction in fatalities. Yes, um, if you compare it to pre-Buhari time, there has been a reduction. Um, I'll, I'll go back to 2014, uh, precisely uh, the data for 2013, when we saw a fatality rate of about 13,400 thereabout for one year alone. And it was that period that the group called Jamaat al-Ahli Sinna al Wal Jihad became the deadliest terrorist group in the world. Now, all of that has changed. There has been a reduction. But like I told you, 10,000 people are still dying in Nigeria. These are people's mothers, people's fathers, sisters, brothers, husbands, wives, children. And it is, you know, absorbed. It is a situation that needs to stop. Um, we cannot, even if the figure is 500, it is still ab absorbed. We cannot have in a, a, a situation where in a year those number of people are dying. So the, the investment, all of these successes that I've mentioned, frankly, uh, dwarfed by the fatalities that I've mentioned. So what I would hope to see is the two major areas, and I'm hoping that um, President Buhari, I'm hoping he's listened to us, he said it on channels, so he's probably not going to listen to this, but I hope I hope you play it some other time and he gets to listen to it. Two major areas, um, improve on, cap on accountability. Um, one of my major worries in 2001 and even before then is we've not seen instances where um, failures, breaches within our security are, you know, penalized. And that is not um, something that we should condone. Where you have instances where there is a clear breach of trust or even a dereliction of duty, then the individual responsible for that must be penalized. So as an example, you talked about the border, which is your second question. I know that the two major agencies that have responsibility for border protection is um, the immigration and the customs in Nigeria. And you're aware that um, the president has even instituted an extraordinary measure that has affected several of our borders. But in spite of all of that, we're still seeing weapons being ferried in into the country. And I'm not aware that anyone within the hierarchy of the customs has been penalized. Now, that is what I mean. We have to have a system where if you fail to live up to the expectation of your office, then, then you, are, you are penalized. Otherwise, what we do is to encourage um, you know, people to continue to fail to meet our expectations and for lack of a better word, to continue to fail us as a country. And that is why people are dying, where there is a clear um, inability to meet the expectations of the office that you are heading, then for God's sake, you should be penalized. So that's number one. Number two, we need to introduce good auditing as well as monitoring and evaluation systems within our security architecture. Now, the only way that you can ensure you show clearly that the individual in question is doing well or is not doing well is when you have good audit systems, good monitoring and evaluation systems that use metrics. And in today's world, it's very easy. I talked about AI. I talked about there are several other um, technological innovations that would allow us to introduce this, um, you know, systems in place that would allow both the executive arm of government and the legislative arm of government to exercise some form of oversight and measure the performances of these individuals, so that quarterly we can, you know, ask for improvement. If, if um, one of the, uh, just as an example, if we pick the police. Um, kidnap is one of the things that has worried us. And I can tell you that in 2001, over 4,000 Nigerians were abducted. Now, if we are doing this type of evaluation that I mentioned, um, quarterly, the 
Inspector General of Police will come and present and show to, to the uh, both executive arm and, as well as the legislative arm that look from January to April, this is the number of persons that were abducted. And this is what we have done to reduce the abduction. And where there is no success, then they know clearly that he has not succeeded and they can ask him why. If they, they give him what he needs to perform and he still doesn't perform, then for God's sake, by the second quarter, they change him. So this is what metrics and monitoring and evaluation will do to us and that, that currently is absent. So these two things um, that I mentioned, um, would, would definitely, if Mr. President in the next, you know, one year if, and a few months that he has, if he's able to do these two things, I bet you would see a change. If not, then I'm sorry, unfortunately, we would look back and, you know, it would still be the same old thing. We we'll still see this number of fatalities that we're seeing that is worrying us. Well, on that very sad note, uh, because unfortunately, I do not know how um, what we, the president could not do in four years or five years would be done in a year. But I want to thank you. Um, Kaveer Adamu is a security expert and he's been speaking with us on Plus Politics. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. Uh, it's been Plus Politics on Plus TV Africa. Don't forget you can uh, watch this show again if you go on our YouTube channels, which is Plus TV Africa and Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. I'm Mary Anacle. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>